Oke. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings to us, the honorable speakers, Prof. Ron Harris, Professor Beckham University, and Dr. Tim Carlton, Independent Consultant, the honorable Dr. Buhanuddin Nur, President of IAGI, the honorable Dr. Hertin Samayhu, Chairman of IAGI Maluku, the honorable Mr. Alfen Rudiawan from Badung Institute of Technology, and all the participants, good afternoon. First of, all, first of all, thank you to God who has given us his blessing, healthy and mercy so that we can gather here to follow this amazing international webinar without something wrong happening. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Catherine as the host for today. We will guide this event. And on behalf of the family, I would like to welcome you all to this international webinar. We are going to talk about Molkan for Indonesia sharing knowledge with Molkan geoscientists, and this event is held by Yagi Maluku, uh, this time as pre-event of Yagi Annual Convention in Makassar 2022. This event is sponsored by Maluku Energi, Energi Abadi and Citic Seram Energy Limit. Before starting our webinar, I would like to read the ground rules during this event. Ervin, please, Pak Ervin. Selamat siang, Pak Hervin. Oke, okay, Catherine, Kat can you see the screen now, Catherine? Can see it, Mr. Harkin. Sorry. So how about this? Can you hear? Can you see the okay. screen? Okay. Okay. Our ground ground rules. First, make sure your computer or laptop or mobile device is connected to the internet. Um, second, moderator have full rights to organize the webinar. Third, Mr. your camera and microphone during the web webinar. Next, uh, question and answer will be open in the discussion session. But during the webinar, participant ask question in the chat room by mentioning name under, uh, underscore intent underscore question. And if you have further questions, For the speakers after this after the event, please contact our email yagimaluku at gmail.com. Okay, so before we start this webinar, I would like to invite everyone to sing national anthem Malaysia Raya.
Okay, all the best participants. I would like to invite uh, the welcoming speech and uh, the chairman of Yaji Maluku for give us the welcoming speech. Mr. Helfin, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Catherine, can you hear my voice, Catherine? Yes, Mr. Helfin. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon to the all participants in the Eastern of Indonesia. Uh, good day to the all participants in the Western of uh, Indonesia. And uh, good morning to uh, Dr. Kim Charlton in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the last, uh, good evening, midnight, sorry, <laughs> to Professor Ron Harris in the United States. Honorable President of Indonesian Association of Geologists, Tiagi, uh, Pak Dr. Burhanuddin Nur. Honorable speakers for today, Prof. Ron Harris and Dr. Tim Charlton. Honorable Al Head of Agencies and Departments who attending this uh, webinar. Esteemed colleagues, Al Senior Geologists or Geoscientists of Indonesia and advisor of uh, Iyaki Maluku. Esteemed local government agency of Moluku, uh, Geosense Universities, and participants of the webinar. Welcome to the international webinar with uh, the GEMS uh, Molucans for Indonesia, sharing knowledge with uh, Molucan geoscientists, conducted by Iagi Commissariat of Moluku. The purpose of the international webinar is to convince geologists or uh, geoscience from Moluku to share and, and provide uh, wider and better understanding of uh, geoscientists and its wide applications. The topics of this activity vary and are related to the tectonics, structural geology, petroleum geoscientists, and engineering geology. This webinar session is held in conjunction with second anniversary of Iagi Moluku and of course, pre-event of 51st and IAGI annual conventions and exhibitions in Makassar. As we knew that geological setting of Eastern Indonesia has a more complicated tectonic setting and suture compared to the Western Indonesia. The complex geology has been caused by the confluence of uh, Indo-Australia, Eurasians, uh, Pacific plates with some micro plates which increase the complexity of Eastern Indonesia. The Banda Arch, which is generally known as the zone of the interactions between the Australian and the Russian place, is the one of the most interesting areas. Various models of the Banda Arch and tectonic setting of the surrounding islands have been published. However, there are many constructing models for the neogen tectonic evolutions in the regions, particularly regarding the nature of subduction around the Banda Arch and its affinity the relationship among the subduction slabs and different tectonic units that comprise Seram, Southeast Maluku, K, Tanimbar, and surrounding islands. In addition, strong tectonic activity in Maluku has encouraged the emergence of the natural hazards, which must be addressed by assessing and reducing risk disaster in Maluku. Today, in the first webinar, Prof. Ron Harris will present about uh, Bahia Ambon, natural hazard risk assessments and reduction in Maluku, and Dr. Kim Charlton will talk detail about the geology of the Eastern Banda Arch as a review of uh, more than uh, 30 years after the field work. In the name of Iagi Maluku, again, I would like to express my uh, deeply gratitude to Prof. Ron Harris and Dr. Tim Charlton for your attendance as their special guest for this outstanding webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Herfin. The next one, we will hear the welcoming speech and also to open officially this webinar from President of IAGI. Mr. Burhaduddin Noor, time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, all the Participant can hear my voice. Is that okay, Pak Catherine and Pak Irvin? Great, thank you, yeah, uh, Bu Lita. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. The Honorable Professor Harris from Brigham Young University, USA. The Honorable Dr. Tim Carlton from UK. And of course, all the senior uh, geoscientists, geologists in here. Also, I would like to special uh, uh, pa Professor Bambang Pratisto from UPN. Good day, good morning, good night, and also good evening in all area in, in the world. And I saw the participant is um, relatively complete in here from East and West, also from overseas. Commissariat Maluku is one of Iaki uh, commissariat and active in activities. A lot of activities in here. Webinar also uh, from uh, level national level and international level. Today we have great international webinar. Molukans from Indonesia for sharing knowledge with Molukan geoscientists, and we have great speakers. Prof. Harris and Dr. Tim Carton. There is a uh, two topic, interesting topic with Bahaya Ambon, natural hazard risk assessment and reduction in Maluku. It will be uh, presented by Professor Harris. And the second is the geology of Eastern Banda Arts a few uh, 30 years after the fifth war. As we know, and I have been mentioned that Eastern Indonesia is always interesting. The geology, the natural hardia, and also how the natural uh, resources in uh, East uh, Indonesia. A lot of questions, a lot of unsolved, a lot of models from all GCM and GCMTs and also geologists in Eastern uh, Indonesia. That's why the government, they set up study program, geological program in Patimura. I think uh, Hervin uh, knows it, uh, and all we know about that. And this activity related to, I think a second year for Iyaki Maluku and also pre-event of annual convention for the 51st, uh, this October 24th and the 27th of October in Makassar. Why in Makassar? Because we know that Eastern Indonesia is very interesting. And then we know about the natural resources, especially in mining, and also the issue of the environment, issue of the energy transition. So we combine this topic in our ERP annual meeting. So Yaki invite all the participants, also Prof. Harris, Dr. Tim Carton, come to Makassar for this, uh, sorry, in the next month, I think uh, 30 days left to uh, register all this about the Yaki activities in Makassar. I would like to thanks to all the sponsor from Maluku Energy Abadi, all the support from ITV, UNHAS, and then ISPG, INPEX, uh, MBW, uh, MBW, and of course, all the committee, especially uh, Herfin and team, keep in the high activities to share all the Geology knowledge, geology uh, application for our community. With Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, international webinar officially open. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Buhanuddin Nur. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
before we start this event, I will guide us to take picture together. So for the participant, please turn on your camera. I will wait uh, five seconds for all the participants to turn on, turn on your camera. Okay, now I will take the picture for the first slide. Give your the best pause. Okay. This my the best thumb. Okay. One, two, three, cheers. Okay. Okay, now we move to the next slide. Slide two. Okay. One, two, three, say cheers. Okay. okay, next slide. One, two, three, say cheers. Okay. And last slide. One, two, three, say cheers. Okay. Okay, thank you for all the participants. For the blessed participants, we will get into the part of this webinar. I would like to read the resume for of, of our moderator today. Our moderator today is Mr. Alvin Rudiawan from Bani Institute of Technology. He has received his bachelor degree at Bandung Institute of Technology and take, taken his master and doctor degree at Royal Holloway University of London. And now he is a lecturer and at Bandung Institute of Technology. Okay, now Mr. Alvin Rudiawan here will take over the event. Mr. Alvin Rudiawan, time is yours. Thank you very much, Gaga Catherine, for the kind introductions. Um, thank you. Allow me to moderate the conversations uh, this afternoon in, in the East End of Indonesia and perhaps still morning in the UK for Tim and pretty close to midnight for Professor uh, Ron Harris. I hope um, this will not be an, an obstacles to do and share the knowledge about East Indonesia. Um, as we know, um, two of our speakers today or tonight um, are two of the most um, prominent researchers and uh, geoscientists in Indonesia, especially in particular in Eastern Indonesia. I bet that most of us have read their works many years and paying attention to what they said about <clears throat> Indonesia, and Eastern Indonesia. And I'm pretty sure that in our sessions here, the two sessions that we are having today, in the next two and a half hours will be a new showers of insights and knowledge from <coughs> our speakers. So before we start the sessions, um, would you please um, be kindly to uh, mute your microphone and I'll ask your courtesy to mute the microphone during the conversation, during the presentations. Um, there will be two sessions, 50 minutes each. will be started um, by Professor Ron Harris and then by Dr. Tim Charlton. Um, 50 minutes each for uh, presentations. And then at the end of the two sessions of presentation, we will have around 30 minutes of uh, questions and answer sessions. So the those sessions um, will be um, handled by the committees. And if should you have any questions during the presentations of two of our um, distinguished speakers today, you could write it down in the chat box of the Zoom. You can write down your name, uh, where you come from, perhaps your institutions, and then your questions. And then we'll try to make use um, the most of the time that we have left at the end of the um, webinar to answer those questions in form of discussions with our two distinguished speakers. So before I'm handing the first 50 minutes, 
to Professor Ron Harris. Allow me to read his CVs. So Professor of um, Professor Ron Harris is a professor of geological sciences at Brigham University, uh, Brigham Young University at BYU. He received his uh, BSc from uh, geological science in the University of Oregon. And then before he graduated as a master's in geophysics in Geophysical Institutes of Alaska. And he graduated as a PhD in geodynamics from University of College London. As we know that he dedicated most of his career to academic research and tectonic evolutions, um, as well as the associated geophysical hazard in the Eastern Indonesia region. If we talk about multidisciplinary research, I think he've already did that in many years of his research, combining you know, tectonics, structural geology, petrology, and so on, uh, with regards, um, with high uh, attention to the natural disaster risk productions. And um, his research has resulted in more than 35 peer-reviewed papers about the tectonics and geophysical hazard of the Nusa Tenggara, Maluku, and the Banda Island. And his genuine interest and passions about East Indonesia has led him to um, the non-profit organizations in harm's way that focus on implementing the effective risk reduction strategies that save lives in East Indonesia. And if, if he's got more time later, um, I think we would really love to hear about something about the in harm's way organizations. Um, so the first 50 minutes is yours, Professor Harris. Thank you so much, um, uh, FND, for your in introduction. And thank you, Jeff. And thank you for the others who have been so gracious to invite me to participate in this meeting. And um, during your introduction, I saw that I've missed out on lots of good meetings that you've had. And so I hope you'll invite me again, not necessarily to speak, but just to be a participant. I'd enjoy that. Uh, let me share my screen here and we can get started. Um, <clears throat> I titled my talk, The Haya Ambon, mainly because I just got back from Ambon. Um, and uh, we were doing some disaster mit mitigation work there. And it strikes me that uh, very few people who live in Ambon have any idea about the history of destruction from earthquakes mostly, and also from landslides and tsunamis that um, have impacted that island in the past. And, will, of course, impact it again in the future. And so I wanted to focus on assessing what the risk is to natural hazards, how, to, how best to communicate that risk to those who really don't know uh, what's happened in the past and what is likely to happen in the future. And most importantly, how to reduce that risk of seismic and tsunami Hazard. So we could also say Bahia Ternate. We could say, um, you know, Bahia Sulawesi, or there's lots of like um, places in Maluku that will be impacted by these events when they next occur. This has been a collaborative effort. Mainly, um, I've benefited most from my colleagues in Indonesia and in Timor Leste who have taught me so much and provided uh, resources and access and support for the research that we've done. I also collaborate with Geoscientists Without Borders on the disaster mitigation. In Harm's Way is a nonprofit I've, I've uh, established to help um, do things that are difficult to get funding for. Also many Indonesian institutes and US institutes. So as was mentioned um, by the president, uh, we have a lot more questions than we have answers in this region. And, and so I thought I would just focus on a few of those. Let me just, there we go. 
The first one, I, I think most of you probably already know the answers to, but I just wanted to, in case there were some who, um, you know, are new to geology that are here to make sure that they understand uh, what causes earthquakes and tsunamis. And then how can we use the past to forecast what's gonna happen in the future? How we are doing that? How often do earthquakes and tsunamis happen in the Maluku region? What are the future risks? And the most important question is what can we do to reduce the risk of natural hazards in Maluku? So let's talk about the first question. This is a, uh, a 3D cross-section through Java um, that was done by uh, uh, the Earth um, Observatory in Singapore. And um, what I wanna emphasize here is that most earthquakes and tsunamis are caused by plate interactions. And in Indonesia, that's mostly convergent plate interactions. You can see here that there's an area that's building up right here and an area that's building up right here. And those are being built up by earthquakes. For example, the volcanic arc that forms most of the islands in Indonesia is associated with earthquakes, not, not um, uh, giant earth, earth, earthquakes, but still enough to do damage and also lots of hazards associated with um, explosive volcanism. On the south side of that, at least, at least in this diagram, you have another type of uh, plate interaction occurring where material from the plate that's going down, the subducting plate, is being accreted or, or being ripped off of the lower plate, uh, the crust of the lower, the lower plate stacked up and forming new mountain ranges. This one here is, is submerged two to three kilometers below sea, but it rises to form mountains two to three kilometers above the sea as we go east where the subducting plate is continental. There's also earthquakes back here where the frictional resistance of this subducting plate will move the volcanic arc this way and cause thrust faulting in what we call the back arc. And <clears throat> so you have the same kind of, of situation going on here as you do here. And so you have places where you have convergence, convergence, these are mechanical, um, uh, mostly uh, mechanical accretion, and this right here is magmatic accretion, all forming um, new continental crust. And the reason we have earthquakes is because the movement here is not continuous. What happens is that the movement is episodic. You can see that in this uh, video here where I'm pulling the string. Oh, whoops, that's, that one's not gonna work. Well, uh, the spring, I, you pull that spring and the, and the brick doesn't move. Even though you're, you're adding pressure, right? you eventually get to a point where the energy in that spring is greater than the energy um, along the, the base of this brick. And so the brick slips. And the energy that was stored in the spring is suddenly released. If we push the spring, the same thing will happen. We'll push and we'll push and we'll push. Eventually we'll get to a point where this will move to the right. Or if we pull, it'll move to the left. You can see these accretions in this sandbox model here. You can see that this is the Asian plate right here in gray. And these are materials coming in on the subducting Australian plate and they're stacking up. This represents thousands of earthquakes. And because this is un underwater, thousands of tsunamis. And it, this accretionary um, buildup is continuing, it hasn't stopped. You can also see it creates uplift and uh, new mountains. Okay, so today I actually, I got the same shirt on as I had earlier today. I actually did a little model so you can see how this works. So this is the <coughs> Australian plate here and here's the Asian plate here. This is made of bubble wrap and I, and I did that so you could actually hear the earthquakes.
Wait for it, wait for it. Yeah. Okay, so what we notice in that uh, very simple kitchen subduction animation or model <clears throat> is that <clears throat> there's a lot of variability. For example, if we go back, there was a place here that had small earthquakes and a place where we had enormous mega thrust earth earthquakes. And if you look at this in a context where we're under the ocean, this is what happens. You can see the same thing going on here, stick right here, stick, 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 because of the friction. And then all of a sudden it slips and it displaces a large column of water. And that's what creates tsunami. The, the column of water collapses and moves away from the disturbance um, at very high velocities and then starts to impact a much broader region than the earthquake does. So it transfers the energy from this right here to a much broader region and creates hazards which are difficult to, um, to avoid. Okay. So we're talking about this part, essentially, of Indonesia, the, um, the area in the box is what I've worked mostly in. And you can see it's made up of these three different parts. Uh, the, the purple here is the accretionary wedge, which is the mechanical accretion. And, and then we have the stable region here in green, which represents uh, the basement and cover of the forearc. And then we have the volcanic arc in yellow with the active volcano shown in red. We have two major zones of convergence. The, the most active one is the one to the south that wraps around as a 180 degree bend. And the less active, but still very dangerous one is dipping to the south. The other direction is going right here behind the volcanic arc. There are other faults like this one, the Wall and A fault and some others, especially the Sarong fault and others here that um, are causing lots of earthquakes and in some cases tsunamis. <clears throat> you can see how many earthquakes, just those that are less than 50 kilometers, which are the ones that are dangerous, that um, have been recorded by seismometers since 1960. So, you know, about 60 years. And some of these are larger and some of these are smaller, but this is a very active region. And thank goodness we have a record of, that quantifies these, but the record only goes back 60 years. Okay, so one of the questions is how can we, we use, whoops, use the past to forecast the future? Let's talk about that. First of all, President Sukarno said, uh, Lupa Sajara never forget history. And James Hutton famously said that, that the, the present is the key to the past and the past is the key to the present. So we have to dig, we have to dig up the past. In this case, we're looking for tsunami deposits and there's actually several of them here. This is on Banda Island right here. This is in uh, Ambon. And <clears throat> we use these records, these are geological records to go further back in time, for example, Here's earthquakes is, as the stars, and you, you can see that um, depending on the rate of strain and also the fault zone, you can have different recurrence in, 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 in intervals. Like, like in this case, the interval is, is shorter, but you can still see it's not periodic, meaning it's not the same amount of time between events, just like the model I, sh I sh showed you. In this case, we either have larger earth earthquakes if, if we have the same um, strain rate, or we have a lower strain rate, so the earthquakes are the same size as these, but not as often. Same as this. In this case, if we had the same strain rate as this and this, these would be enormous earthquakes because all the strain that's being released by these events would uh, happen in just one event or two events. But the problem is that the instrumental record that we use so much is so limited. Only one earthquake in this whole chart would have been captured by seismometers. 
and historical accounts, which would represent in Indonesia, this yellow zone, which goes from about 15 to 1600 to the present, right? So 400 years is all. And again, we would only have one event. We would have missed this one here. And we would think this is a safe place to live because it hasn't had any earthquakes, right? This is what happened to the Java Trench. We don't have any evidence of huge megathrust earthquakes there because the last time it ruptured, we just learned, was 500 years ago before the Dutch were keeping records. And, <clears throat> and so if you look back in time, you can also look at archeological da data and geological data to get a much broader window of what's actually going on. And so we've counted at least 66 damaging earthquake events in Ambon alone since 1629. So that averages a damaging earthquake event every six years. Now there's not very many places on the planet that have a damaging earthquake rate that's that high. So we also can look at um, in a place like Indonesia, which is mostly ocean, most of the active faults are underwater. And so they pose another threat, and that is that they can transfer the energy of the earthquake to the sea. This shows an example, I guess we're in Alaska here, or a place that just had a volcanic eruption and buried everything in ash. You can see the sea goes out sometimes, depending on which side of the subduction you're on, and then it picks up all this sand, it brings it onshore and deposits that sand. If it deposits the sand in a place where sediments are preserved, then you have a record like this of several different tsunami deposits, which are encased in low energy um, sediments. You can see here the tsunamis. This is the 2004 tsunami in Banda Aceh, and then another tsunami that happened before that, and another tsunami that happened before that, and so on. So we can use different age um, dating methods to determine what uh, the history is of tsunamis. And then if we can get these from several different places, we can determine the location of the earthquake that causes tsunami. And by looking at the inundation, we can determine the magnitude. So the geological record can help us a tremendous amount. Uh, let's see, where's my, there we go. For example, here's a trench we dug right in, um, in, uh, in, um, at, in Ambon, <clears throat> right next to the new, new bridge, we found a tsunami that was in historical accounts, actually several of them that were in historical accounts and then ones that happened before that. We've also uh, measured things like co-seismic uplift of coral reefs and so on to get ideas as to when megathrust earthquakes occurred in the past. So how often do these earthquakes and tsunamis happen in Maluku? This is a recently published um, compilation of earth, earthquakes in historical records uh, by this French woman who I don't know how to say her name. She just recently published it in 2021. And we just recently found a new earthquake that nobody has included in their records, which happened in 1898 in Ambon, which I'll talk about in just a second. And you can see that I've circled here many earthquakes that happened during the 19th century. And you can see that they kind of cluster. There was also a huge volcanic eruption here, the largest that we've had in modern times of Tambora, which happened in 1815 as, as well. Um, here's another uh, representation of this where I show the earthquakes and tsunamis that occurred in the 17th century um, and then the 18th century, there wasn't a lot. And then we start getting them in the 19th century. And you, you can see the clustering here. We call that stress contagion. Because as, as a nearby part, a nearby fault zone ruptures, it can change the earthquake cycle of another fault zone. And so you can see that there was an earthquake storm down in the Lesser Sunda Islands and then one up in the, in the Malaccas right there. And uh, we had this big 1852 event, which ruptured probably a place close to the 1869 event. <laughs> and you can see that we continue, look how many earthquakes there were in the 19th century. Okay. 
<clears throat> they keep going. This is the 98 one right here. And 1898 one, this is the 1899 one again. Um, probably stress contagion going on there. <clears throat> and then I show you the ones in the, in the uh, 20th century right here that you can see. And then the ones in the 21st century, which have happened much more recently. And the thing I wanna show, show you is that the reason why we wanna know when these occurred and how large they are is because then we can make a calculation as to exactly, not exactly, but an estimate of how much strain has accumulated along that fault zone since it last ruptured. For example, at a convergence rate of five centimeters per year, uh, since this occurred, that's about 10 meters has already accumulated there. This one's 17 meters, this is 15. And we have a whopping 30 meters here since it's been over 500 years. And we don't know exactly how much strain is accumulated here. And that's mainly because our historical records are not very good in places where there were no Dutch outposts. But the bottom line is we already have enough strain accumulated along the Java Trench and the Timor and Tanabar troughs and the Saram trough to create huge earthquakes, mega thrust earthquake events. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, of when. This is, these are some photos that were taken um, in 1898 of the destruction that happened in Ambon from that earthquake. It was at least probably in 1907 and probably happened on a fall zone that goes right through Ambon Bay, according to our analysis of the Mercalli scale uh, intensity of shaking. This is a summary then of the major um, damaging events that have happened. And again, these are just from historical accounts. And you would think the historical accounts wouldn't be near as good way back in as they are now. But you can see a very dangerous <laughs> trend here where these are all the ones that happened in the 19th century here. And then after that, really the last major earthquake that happened in Maruku, right, was in 1899. Look at this gap here. Does that mean that the plates have slowed down? Does that mean that the rate of strain accumulation has changed? No, it means that there's a lot of loading on the faults, at least the ones we know about and a lot on the ones we don't know, know, know about, which, which tells us that the future is not going to be easy to deal with. We have to prepare. This is, these fault zones are gonna release their strain. <clears throat> we can also see tsunamis here, right? And, and these are other earthquakes uh, that uh, weren't damaging. So what do we do about that? Well. One way is we can kind of reconstruct what the earthquake did in the past. You can see here that we've used all of these um, locations in Ambon and, uh, and islands near there to determine how much the, what the intensity of shaking was. These, this is the Mercalli scale shaking number, which goes up to 12 and down as low as, as one. But by doing it, or down as low as zero, no effects, okay? And by doing this, we could make a map that shows which areas had the most intense shaking. And you can see it's not distributed evenly, that there has to be not just how close you are to the fault zone that makes a difference, it also makes a difference as to what you're built on. So the site characteristics of where you actually live or what, where your building is as to how much damage. You can see that Ambon Bay, right where Ambon City is particularly, had a lot of damage. <clears throat> There's also a lot we can get from tsunamis. For example, this is the uh, island of Banda Mira, in uh, the Banda Island chain. And we know from historical accounts that the 1629 tsunami from an earthquake somewhere get, went all the way up here, flooded the old fort, which is Fort Nassau here. And so they moved the new fort up here to be out of, uh, tsunami range, which was smart. Then they had one, the 1852 event, and then the 1841 event. And you can see that if we repeat any of these, look at all of the built environment, which is in danger. 
1852 event particularly has been one that we've tried to reconstruct because there were several records scattered throughout this region of Maluku that provided us enough data that we could back calculate or do an, an, an inversion to try to determine exactly where this happened. For example, at each one of these red dots, there were descriptions of how long it took for the tsunami to arrive after the earthquake started or ended. Also, in some cases, it said how much, how far the earthquake went in, and in some cases, how high the earthquake was, or how high the tsunami was, how far the tsunami inundated, and um, other information, which then we can use to develop models. The first approach to this was to just develop these ad hoc models. We develop a model, let it run, and see how closely it fit the observations. And then we'd say, well, if we tweak the model a little bit here and a little bit there, let's run it again. And maybe it was better and maybe it was worse. And after about four or five tries, we'd be like, okay, this is where we think it is. And we thought it was down here. But then I went to the math department and I said, just gotta be a more quantitative way to do this using a supercomputer. And so in this case, we used a, a statistical analysis called a Bayesian uh, an analysis, which essentially you produce a prior saying, okay, the likelihood of the earthquake that affected these places is somewhere in this band. And you can see the yellow is the higher probability and the blue is the lower. And then we, we let the computer randomly put a dot here and start to move towards higher and higher probability as it changes the earthquake parameters. And eventually what happened after 300,000 iterations, which took us two and a half months, it zeroed into this one area here, showing that it had to have been right here. That none of, an earthquake in any of these other places, no matter what the fault zone parameters were, would not satisfy what was observed in these red dots. So we're getting better and better and better if we have enough data. So what about the future risks? Well, if you look at the plate configurations and the amount of strain that it has accumulated on them, we have enough strain already here to produce a magnitude nine event. We have enough strain here to produce magnitude 8.4. We already have enough strain here to produce magnitude 8.8. .8. We already have enough strain here to produce a magnitude 8.7. These are enormous earthquakes that are going to affect a huge area, not only in terms of ground shaking, but in also in terms of tsunami hazards. We have to plan for this because it's going to happen in our future. We can't just continue to have seismic quiescence along these active plate patterns. So one thing that we can do is we can try to determine who's most at risk by site characteristics. For example, when a seismic wave travels through solid rock, it has a very low amplitude and it goes through the rock really fast. But when it hits something that is, is weaker, like in this case, um, some poorly consolidated sediment in a stream over the bedrock, it slows down and the amplitude goes up. So we call this amplification of the seismic energy. Sometimes it can amplify up to seven to eight times, maybe even 10 to 12 times what it would be on the, other, on, on the, the nearby areas. And the same happens when you have sediment, it goes through, and especially if you have poorly consolidated sediment, and especially if you have water saturated sand or mud. Think of all of the built environment in Maluku that's built right here and is going to experience this. We can mitigate for that. We can measure what we call the VS30, which is the velocity of, of seismic wave at 30 meters, the upper 30 meters of surface. And so in hard rock, we get really high velocities and in soft soil, we get very low ones. So we've done this, um, uh, where you can assign site classes, like this would be site class A, site, site class B, site class C, site class D, and site class E. And so you can designate all the places in Maluku that have a built environment by a site class. And depending on which class it is, you can take 
steps to mitigate the damage. This is one way we've been doing it over the last uh, four or five years throughout Mulupi. Um, we set a bunch of geophones, which are essentially just microphones, out at a sp spaced intervals. And then we get a strike plate here and we get a sledgehammer and we hit it with that strike plate, which has a trigger wire, which connects to a seismograph. And what happens is as soon as that hits, then this, the earthquake that we created, the small one, by the, size, by the sledgehammer passes through these and provides us with a velocity. And so you can see here, all those red um, geophones there are set up. This is our seismometer right here. And this is the strike plate and my student hitting it. This is, these are the results for Ambon Island. So you can see that some of these are very low. Site class E, right? Right where most of the built environment is here. You can see that most of this, most of the rest of the island where there's topography, has very high velocities up above 600. But you can see that the coastal plains where most of the people live are much lower. So we have to mitigate, we have to build things differently there or they're gonna collapse. This is um, again, the MMI map from the 1898 event we, where we had observations in all of these places here. Now, when I compare these two, you can see that the damage from the 1898 event is very similar to the VS-30 map that we just made a few years ago. So wouldn't it have been nice if back in 1898, they would have known this and could have built their, um, their hospital, like in this case, collapsed, stronger so it could withstand the amplification of the seismic wave. For example, here's the Banda Islands. This is Banda Nira, again, really low, really low. Banda Nira has been flattened. It says completely flattened to a rubble heap. This is what the, the uh, anecdotal uh, accounts say five times. Why? Because of these low VS30 values. Okay, another thing that we can check is not only the VS30 of the ground that you're shaking at, but each building type has a resonant frequency. For example, I, I like to play the cello. I'm not any good, but I like to play it. And you can see, depending on which string, you used, you can get a different pitch or a different sound. And that's because each of these strings, like the C string and the A string, have a different resonant frequency. Okay, the, um, the C string is 264 hertz, the A string is 444. Same is true with buildings. So this little thing right here, a lot easier than stringing out a bunch of geophones, is a horizontal vertical spectral resonance. Um, device, which allows us to determine what the resonant frequency is for different sites. That we can use directly to measure not only VS30, but also to predict what type of buildings to build in these sites so that they aren't close to the resonant frequency of the shaking. This is the record that it produces. You can see here, this is the amplification of the seismic wave. Here, this site, if you build a building that has a resonant frequency from one to two, you're in trouble because it, it's going to amplify the seismic waves by five to six times here. Whereas if you have a resonant frequency of the building at a higher hertz or lower, you're in better situations. So what we do is we model this, this, we draw this blue line, which provides some in information. I want you to watch this. This is the one second period right here, okay? There's the two second. You need to know to build the building less than that or more than that or less and more than this and so on, depending on the frequency. Okay, so this is an example. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Ambon and, and we took some measurements, HV and SR ones, and we found that the, that the resonant frequency, the amplification was one to two seconds which wouldn't affect this building, but would affect this new hospital. And you can see here, you don't see any cracks. So there was an earthquake in 2019, just after we, we left, and it didn't do any damage to this building here, which is a much older building, and it's not built near as strongly as this one. But look what happened to the hospital. All these cracks, these are really high. The cracks lower, they just plastered over, right? 
But now this hospital is weak. There's no way this hospital is gonna be near as resistant to the next earthquake as it was before it was compromised by the shaking from an earthquake that was in Saram. Let's talk about tsunamis. So the 1852 earthquake also produced a large tsunami. This is our, our um, numerical model of it. These again are the places where we recorded information. This is where we thought it actually was initially, right? And you can see the negative wave going all the way across. So the sea would be withdrawing there and the positive wave then arrives. And you can see how it dances around these islands. It gets stuck here. And you can see even, even an hour, two hours afterwards, there's still high waves in Buru and Ambon and Western Saram and, and uh, uh, Saparua and so on, right? And over here in Timor still, Look at this, there's, there's still uh, waves that are refracting, if I can get that to play again. Uh-oh, maybe I messed it up. There we go. Okay, let's, let's, uh, we have tidal gauge location. These are the fault parameters that we, that we did this with. You can see how fast the wave moves in deep water versus how slow it moves in, in shallow water here as it goes towards Australia. You can also see the wavelength is different. But look at how much destruction is going on right now in this whole area. Okay. Here's another one um, that we did with a different model. This is using commit as a model, and you can see the negative wave. So the sea would all be withdrawing here for about 20 minutes, and then the positive wave arrives. And you can see it goes into Ambon Bay right there, and especially hits this area right in here. And look at what's going on near Masoli right here. And Bandanera is just getting clobbered. Okay. Come on, go to the next one. All right, so this is what happens in Ambon Bay right here. There is the negative wave. And you notice there's a choke point right here, okay? The positive wave, oh, it goes, amplifies a lot, but then it stays in here. <laughs> it never goes away. And you can see these surges of waves. There's no way this can drain. And so this is being flooded for, where's the time right there, for many hours, okay? Is Ambon ready for this? Well, I just got back and I'm sorry to say that very few people have done tsunami evacuation drills. There's very few places where there's, there's any kind of warning system. Most people don't know what to do when they feel the ground shake. There's a lot of work you need to do. Okay. Here's the inundation map. And so you can see here high tsunami flood over five meters all along here. The 1852 event had a three meter tsunami that came in and affected Fort Victoria. We've done this all along the Java Trench where we've made models for a complete rupture of the Java Trench and show here in blue, the, the run-up the run heights, 26 meters, right? And look what we have here in Dempasar, right? 27 meters, Lombok, 35. And how many people live in this inundation zone? You know, 600,000 in Dempasar, 82,000 in Matra, all on this coast. We're in the process of completing this also for Maluku. You can see we've got detailed maps here of each of the population centers and what they're going to deal with. Well, there's also tsunamis that can be caused by volcano collapse, as we learned in 2018, as Krakatoa collapsed and created a tsunami, a silent killer tsunami that wasn't associated with an earthquake. So we have to be aware of that, especially since we have so many volcanoes in Maluku that are active and that are sticking up just there 
head above the water. This is Banda Api in the Banda Islands here. And you can see that there's a fault zone, a uh, west dipping fault zone that cuts right through the summit. During the last eruption, you had magma come out of this side of it and this side of it, no magma come out of the top. This is what we've used as a way of modeling. That's where the, the fault zone is right there, okay? And um, this is an animation of what's gonna happen when that slumps. You can see it's gonna displace the water as far as gonna come back on. It's gonna completely cover the islands here to the west. It's also gonna go all the way into Bandanera. You can see the runup heights here, 76 meters, 63 meters. In Bandanera, 23 meters. In Lonthar, you know, 14, 25, 32. The problem with this is we don't have any warning if we're just gonna use tidal gauges. We have to monitor what that volcano is doing. We have to put GPS instruments on both sides of that fault zone and measure continuously what's going on. All the way over this island, nobody's going to be able to survive on that. Island, okay, and look at the time here: four, five minutes. There's not going to be any time for warning once the landslide happens. This is a 3D view of it here. Here's Banda Api. There's the landslide, and the complete submersion of, the, of these islands here. This is what's going to happen to Bandon Nero, which is right here. You can see the seismic, the tsunami wave coming in, banking off of Lonthar, and then hitting Bandon Nero. Uh, just to summarize the runoff heights here, how high they are, and to show what parts are going to be in, in, inundated. Okay, the last question and the most important one. What can we do to reduce the risk of natural hazards? This is why I set up my nonprofit in harm's way. I can get money from lots of places to study the Banda Akbe volcano or active faults in Ambon, but I can't get any money for communicating the risk or trying to implement risk reduction strategies. So that's why I set it up so that that we could do the most important work because assessing the risk is not gonna save lives. As we learned in the 2004 tsunami where hundreds of thousands of people died, assessing the risk, there were several publications, including one that I wrote that said there was gonna be a big tsunami there at some point in time, right? We didn't know when, but that never got to the people who were in harm's way or nor anything to help them to know what to do about it. And so they were blindsided. All right, so assessing risk, forecasting is important, but it doesn't stop there. Mostly the geoscientists who are involved in this. Well, all of this is everybody's responsibility. Geoscientists always ha also have to be associated with communicating the risk and impl implementing risk reduction strategies so that we have response efficacy, so people are not blindsided. We need to be proactive, not wait until something happens and then go in and spend billions of dollars of humanitarian relief. Not that we shouldn't do that, but to not have part of that money go towards preparedness is wrong. Indonesia needs to do something about that. If people are gonna bring the, the relief money in, then a certain percent of that should be dedicated to preparedness to make sure that what happened in the past is not repeated. So this is the premise that we've worked under for a long time. If we can identify the risk, that's enough, right? And we'll save lives. We can identify the risk by looking at historical records, geologic records, seis seismic, uh, like uh, seismographic re records, active faults and stuff, which is what we're really good at, but it doesn't work to save lives. It's just the beginning. We have to follow through. We have to mitigate by not only doing the technical stuff, but also the social stuff. One of the most important walks I ever had in my life was when I walked from the, our geoscience building over to the social science building, started talking to people about how 
we could communicate and implement risk reduction strategies. And so we started doing this. We started doing capacity surveys, natural warning systems, evacuation practice, and we evaluated these to see if we were doing them right. And this is what's making a difference. We've seen thousands of lives so far since we've, since we've, since we've bridged this gap between the technical and the social, okay? And this is one example in Ambon. Julian Fritha, right here, who uh, worked for the BBBD, right, teamed with me. She spoke English well enough that we could communicate well. And she went and got people from the Red Cross, people from the regional defense coordinator, the head of the BPBD, the, the uh, head of BMKG, and brought them together and started to talk about these other two things. How can we communicate? How can we implement risk reduction strategies? For me, it was one of the most important uh, groups that I've ever worked with because it's the first one I've seen in Indonesia. Hopefully the rest of Maluku will take heart and follow this example. So we were in, in charge of listening to the earth. They were in charge of listening to the residents and they were in charge of helping the residents reduce risk, okay? So I set up In Harm's Way. You can go there, it's inharmswayhelp.org. And you can see, we got, you can go through it and see what we're about. But what we're really about is trying to empower people to know what's going to happen in the future and to prepare for it. For example, there are these heroes from Maluku like Martha, Christina, Tiahahu. We're raising up modern, Martha, Christina, Tiahahus here by helping them to not battle against the Dutch, but to battle against natural disasters, reducing natural disasters. This is us doing a, a um, field trip where they have a map of their community and they're identifying the hazards. Same with the young men. Notice that both of these groups are in uniforms because they are part of the scouting organization. Pamuka. I asked them, Pamuka's motto is Siop Damaspada. And I'm like, so what are you supposed to be ready and aware of? And most of them couldn't tell me. I mean, it used to be the communists or the Dutch or something, but now what is it, right? And we agreed that one of the best things they could be ready and aware of was natural hazards. And they could be. They could be the beacon on the hill. They could be the ones that carry the torch. Um, oh, Patimura. They could, they could be like a, a Captain Patimura of modern day time. Okay, so this is what we've done. We've, we've, we've reached out and we've taken the geology to the people. We've also listened to the earth. We've told the people what the earth is telling us. We're trying to help them to listen to the earth too so they can be prepared. This is all proactive stuff, not reactive stuff like disaster um, relief, meaning that this is happening during peacetime. That's when you prepare for war is when there's no war. Okay, so the summary, we did lots of surveys so we could quantify what people actually were ready for and aware of. They say the tsunamis never happen here. They only happen in Banda Aceh and in Sumatra. They said, warning systems will save us. I'm like, what warning system? They're gonna wait until the government tells us what to do so they don't do the wrong thing. And, and another myth is that small earthquakes they feel are gonna reduce the risk of large ones. And so we need to try to change that. We were mostly surveying junior high and high school students. So we could have the same age group across all the way from Sumatra to Ambon. And there wasn't that much difference. We published three papers about this. The most important things people can do is that they can first of all get a quake alarm. I know that duck cover and hold on is what most people say, but a lot of the buildings in Indonesia are not going to withstand the shaking and they'll collapse. Duck covering and hold on is not gonna protect you. This is a case, this is one of my students showing that these desks actually held up that huge uh, beam of concrete that fell down on top of 
these and that if somebody would have ducked and covered, they would have been saved. But the most important thing is to evacuate. As soon as you start to feel the earthquake is to evacuate. But if it's, the earthquake is shaking at the time you're trying to evacuate, it's very dangerous. You can't run when the earth is shaking. So these earthquake alarms have a pendulum that sits between two sensors. The P wave from the earthquake, which was a lot faster than the shaking wave, will activate that alarm. And so you can have five to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 seconds to act before the actual wave arrives. These should be in every school. They're only like $20 or so. Indonesia should make a bunch of these and put them all over the place to save lives. This is the earthquake that happened in 2018 in Lombok. There were over a thousand schools destroyed from that. Fortunately, it happened when none of the kids were in there or there would have been thousands of children that were killed. Another thing is tsunami disaster mitigation. We've taken all the science of tsunamis in terms of risk reduction and reduced it to three numbers so that people can self evacuate. They're not gonna wait for the government to tell them what to do. They're not gonna wait for an alarm because we know that doesn't work. It's impossible for it to work because of the scale of the problem and getting the warning to the last mile. And so if you feel the ground, if you're, if you're close to the coast and you feel the ground shake for 20 seconds, that means that the rupture zone has ruptured almost hundred kilometers. It's taken about 20 seconds for that to, to occur at about five kilometers per second, right? A hundred kilometer rupture is at least a magnitude seven event, which could at least produce a tsunami or a landslide like what happened in Palu. Right? And so if you feel something for 20 seconds, you've got to act, even if you barely feel it, because some of these mega thrust earthquakes are actually what we call slow earthquakes. You can hardly feel the shaking and the tsunamis are larger because more of the energy is transferred to the water. So you have 20 minutes after you feel that earthquake, you have 20 minutes to get out. Some places it's less, like in Palu, it was 10, right? Some places it's, it's more. But this is a good, if you can start to immediately, as soon as you can stand up after the ground stops moving, you've got to get out of there. You can't go gather stuff or go look for pe people. You've got to get out of there. And you've got to go to 20 meters elevation. Think of how many lives would have been saved in Banda Aceh if the people would have just known this. The ground shook for nine minutes in Banda Aceh which reduced the amount of time they had to, to but, but, but they didn't know there was a connection between that ground shaking and the ocean and a big wave. And so they didn't evacuate. And even if they would have just ran inland, the likelihood of them dying would have been much, much lower. Tens of thousands of lives would have been saved with just the 20-20-20 principle. So all over Indonesia, you see these signs. Go here if you want to evacuate. But the people don't know when to do it, right? And so if you put these signs here, it tells them when to do it. It tells them how much time they have. It tells them that what they have to do. It tells them to follow this sign to get to 20 meters, right? And so we need to add these to the existing network of signs. We need to make sure these point the right way too. We followed many of these in cities we, we went to and they pointed to like schools, or they pointed to official buildings and the schools and the buildings were like in the inundation zone. And because the idea was the people go there and then we'll truck them from those buildings to a safe place without having any clue that they only had 20 minutes to get out of the way. So evacuation drills are also very, very important for making a difference because people get it when you do an evacuation drill, especially if you make it fun and see who can get there fast enough, the fastest and you do it over and over and over again. We've also done things like art for resilient communities where they've done a diorama of their cities and they've identified all the hazards. This you can even see we put a cross section here. This is Ambon right here. And, and they've, they've put their, a pin where their home is or where their office is and um, what the inundation zone is. And, and 
they've gone around the community and taken photos of all of the natural hazards that they face and so on. And we've passed these out, how to build back better. And so I like to close with just this quote, disaster mitigation has implications which are quite different and much further reaching than those of disaster relief. Mitigation aims to increase the self-reliance of people in hazard prone environments, to demonstrate that they have the resources and the organization, and I would add, the response efficacy to withstand the worst effects of the hazards to which they are vulnerable. In other words, disaster mitigation in contrast to dependency creating relief is empowering. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was some talks uh, from you. Um, for me, that's quite new that you did some works with the students there with Pramuka. That was the most thing that impressed me. You worked with these kids. Uh, for these uh, disaster uh, mitigations program, which is very brilliant. Um, before we move on to the next one um, and compiling some questions that might be arise from uh, your presentations, um, we will have two minutes break for a promotional videos from Iagi Maluku. Pa Ervin, would you please turn on the video? Welcome back, everybody. I'm pretty sure that there will be plenty of questions from you um, after listening to the awesome presentations from Professor Harris. 
um, please um, write it down your questions or be ready when the Q and A sessions will be started after following the uh, next sessions from Dr. Tim Charlton. If you have one um, questions or some questions, you please uh, put it on the chat box there by stating your name, your affiliations, and then your questions. And then we'll try to make use uh, most of the time for the Q&A sessions, catering your um, concerns or questions. Before we swiftly move on to the second sessions, um, allow me to read Dr. Tim Charlton CVs um, as he works for uh, in, in Eastern Indonesia for almost 40 years started as a PhD student uh, in 1987, studying the Kolbano area in the southern West Timor. And later he did two postdoctoral research projects with the London University Research Group, um, doing a study of in Tanimbar and Kay Island in Southeast Maluku, and also participated in London University Sorong Fault Zone projects, um, especially in Waigeo and various islands in North Maluku regions. In 1990, he started working as a consultant geologist, mainly petroleum potential in Eastern Indonesia, based in the US. And then in the year 2000, he focused primarily on this geological uh, virgin territory around Timor Island. And 2016 and 2020, um, he's paid more attention to Timor Gap, a techn technical lead, lead for the onshore petroleum explorations. Um, Dr. Tim, if you are ready, the 15 minutes of the screen time is yours. You're on mute, Tim. You're still on mute. There you go. Oh, it was on and still now it's mute again. Oh, it was on very briefly and then I don't know if it's if it's because of the connections. You're still on mute, Tim. How about that? Now? There you Am go. I... Okay. There and, you go. And you can see my screen, okay? Um screen's not there yet. Share. Sure. Uh... Oh dear. Sorry, I'm, but can, can anybody advise me what, what I need to do to start the screen? Okay, can you, can you stop screen and perhaps reshare the screen? Uh, or maybe Pa Erfin can help you with the slides that you gave to the committee earlier? No. Yeah. It's okay, Tim. Take your time. I'm getting lots of Microsoft Outlook messages. Uh, what What did it say exactly? Well, it's saying create new profile. Um, it, should, it shouldn't say I'm that. Not, um, would, not, you, would, you, would you like to be uh, assistant? Uh, oh, okay, I got it now. I, I'm sorry. This is right. Shit. There you go. All right. Now are you seeing us? Are you seeing a? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. It's okay. All we need is the slideshow. Yeah. The slide. um, all right. Full. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Uh, no it's lovely to be back in um, Maluku, even if it is only virtually. Um, I was very pleased when Jeff. Malaholo invited me to do this talk, but my, I must admit my first reaction was, oh dear, I, I haven't uh, worked seriously in uh, Maluku area for 30 years, and what am I going to say? Um, 
But then I thought about uh, the work I did in the 1980s and the, the final field season, which was really the big one, um, was never published because it was a proprietary study for an oil company. And I thought after 30 years of um, silence, I could actually share this information. It's only field-based geological data. So um, particularly see the theme of the um, strapline of this uh, conference, uh, sharing knowledge with Moluccan ge geoscientists. I thought it was time to um, at least get some of these uh, field results into the public domain. So um, the uh, moderators already in, uh, summarized what I, who I am and uh, what I'm doing. Um, this is me now um, re recently doing field work. And these pictures of me doing field work in Kay and Tanimbar back in the 1980s. You can see not, not so much hair now, but um, still the same glasses. Um, so yeah, so I, this, this is work um, that I did uh, in the late 1980s. Um, it, um, I've already mentioned that this was part of a um, postdoctoral study at um, London University in the London University Research Group. Um, as bad as, as Jeff um, Mallow Hollow, uh, I also met during this period um, in the Sorong Fault Project, which was another um, Robert Hall's research project at that time in the 19, late 1980s. Since when I've been continuing studies of particularly now working in Timor Leste, and this is my field team uh, working in Timor Leste recently. Uh, Deborah and Dino and Maria, and we've been carrying out uh, mapping there, and I'm hoping to go back to that soon. But returning to um, um, Maluku, which is the, the work I was doing here in the 1980s, um, I had did three main field seasons in the Tanimbar and Kay Islands. The first one was in 1986. <coughs> this is uh, a follow-up to the Dutch-Indonesian um, Snellius II project. Um, they, during that project, they didn't manage to sample uh, from Tanimbar. So um, Michiel de Smet from Free University Amsterdam and myself and Steve Kay from London University, together with Hanum Faini from um, GRDC, Puslip Bang, Geologi in Bandung. Um, we went to uh, the Tanimbar Islands in 1986 and we collected samples from the Niji. Uh, section for geohistory analysis. That's the history of vertical movements. And these results were published in this um, thesis. This uh, LJ van Mahler, who um, looked at the forum and effort from these samples to determine the uplift history. So then the following year, myself and Steve Kay from London University, together with Hanang Samodra and Herman Sugila from um, GRDC Bandung, we went back and did a further survey of the geology of the Tanimbar Islands, a general uh, geological survey, and this was published in the Journal of Southeast Asian Earth Sciences. But then the third field season, which was a, a fairly substantial two to three months of field work, um, myself together again with Michiel de Smet and Steve Kay, but also Simon Barkham from London University, and together with JJ Papilaya from um, Pertamina, we did some field work for Union Texas and they admit to oil companies who had the um, PSC license over this area at that time. And of course, because it was a proprietary study, the results were never published. And I did very briefly in 2011 visit the Tanamar Islands again with the ITB group, Ben Sapi's team, um, uh, who for another oil company, Hess, who were interested in the area at this time. So what I'm going to do today is just review the geology of the Tanimar Islands from this fieldwork and the Kay Islands. And then just a couple of slides just about talking about the Jurassic of Saram, the Triassic Jurassic of Saram. So starting with the Tanimar Islands, which of course I don't need to explain where they are in this audience, but I will do anyway. So it's to the east of Timor, um, with the immediately uh, North and, east, north and west of the Timor Tanimar Trough, the deformation in front of the Banda Arc, and of course along uh, trend also from the Kai Islands, Kai Islands to the north, separated from the volcanic arc by the Weber Deep. 
So on the left is the, a geological map of uh, the Town and Borough Islands that we compiled, and on the right, a stratigraphic uh, section. So for those of you who don't know Tanimbar Islands, there's one big island, Yamdena, and a long trend to the south, Salaru, and to the north, uh, Larat and Fordata. Um, most of Yamdena Island is still fairly well covered with jungle, which is great for the environment, but not so good for geology. Um, but it seems that most of this eastern area, this blue area, has these Miocene limestone, the Batimufudi formation. And this is stacked up in a fold and thrust belt, uh, nicely folded and uh, thrusted structures, and just a few inliers of older rocks. Uh, to the west of the fold and thrust belt is this gray area, we call the Mbubuan mud complex. Um, and this seems to be just the accumulated material of the ejection, ejector from mud volcanoes indicated by these symbols, active mud volcanoes. And most of this area is either um, shaley melange or very often just uh, areas of boulder sized blocks of uh, Mesozoic limestones and shales, things like that, um, where the probably the original volcanic, uh, the mud matrix of this mud volcanic eruptive material has been removed and you're just left with a lag of boulders over much of this area, a lot sort of uh, uh, mangrove uh, swampy areas, well, not swampy, but mangrove coast along here. Then uh, to the uh, west of this uh, Yamdana Straits, there's another row of islands, uh, which we just call the Western Islands, which um, uh, expose the most interesting geology. There's metamorphic rocks shown for, by this star symbol here, but then also um, a stratigraphic section ranging in age from Permian right through to the Miocene, uh, Triassic, Jurassic in particular, and early Cretaceous. So I'm now just going, oh, um, I've just for um, record, I've also produced more uh, detailed maps of some of these islands. So this is um, uh, from Molu. I've just put these in. So if anybody wants to make use of them, they can grab them from the uh, from the presentation or if anybody wants a PDF copy either co contact the organizers or or me I can send you a copy of the presentation so I can get it properly into the public domain but so this is um, Molo and Marrow Islands in the north of the uh, archipelago um, and the geology of those areas there's some along the coast down here so it's southeast coast there are marbly type limestones in the Libobar formation. I'll be going through the stratigraphy next. But um, in addition, there's also this brown unit, the Maru formation, which is a uh, Triassic sandstones and shales. We called it the Maru formation after Maru Island down here, but it's actually better exposed on Molu. But the name Molu had already been used in the Molu complex by the GRDC previous mapping, uh, Sukardi and Sutrisma. Um, so, um, uh, in addition, there's also exposed on Molu is the Ungla formation, which I'll be talking about uh, in a while, and a little bit of uh, younger material. The next group of islands here, uh, Mitak and Kabawa, and uh, these islands with Makassar and Tenaman, which I didn't really do much work on. But the main point of interest, particularly for the oil companies was the um, local uh, boat captain when I took a when I said I wanted to go to this place he told me it was called Tanjung Minyak so that obviously got the uh, oil companies very interested uh, apparently there's oil seen floating on the surface in this area frequently um, and this is a mud volcano um, and these islands are mostly mud volcanoes this is a new, well, this is the one I'll have to be talking briefly about later I just call it the new island because it came and disappeared again. Um, these, this group of islands are probably my favorite islands from Laibowa, uh, which is the highest island in the Tanimbara archipelago. It says on the uh, topographic map it's 400 meters, but Google Earth says it's only about 340 meters high. But um, this is the exposing metamorphic rocks along the coast here, possibly a little bit here. Uh, and 
uh, these live over limestones, metaverse of marbly type limestones. And also this Ungar formation, and this is Ungar Island. Um, and uh, this is probably my favorite island of all, most interesting. Um, these are, are more detailed. This is actually um, just from my field sketch at the time. Remember back in the 1980s, we didn't have uh, GPS or anything like this. So this was just a notebook, uh, a sketch of the island drawn in my notebook. And for this uh, talk, I just tried to update it by um, reinterpreting it from uh, Google Earth. And uh, this is now a revised map of um, Ungar Island, which will be um, showing some more slides of later. What our island here, um, the main interest is the Watar formation, which is just to show this is that up again, again, more Ungar formation and Batibafudi Myosin formation. And finally, this, this detailed map of Wuli Aru and Selu Island. Wuli Aru is probably the well, biggest island of this uh, western chain, but we didn't find very interesting geology on there. What was interesting was Selu Island, um, this location down here. Only we didn't do much field work here, but this exposes Permian rocks of the October, what we call the Selu Formation. And also Kizuri Island here. This is another volcano. Down here, I've just got a, a picture of Selu looking from the uh, looking from the west, and you see this classic shield volcano shape of a mud volcano. And up here, there's a little bit of eruption of um, oil, uh, mud, and gas. Um, uh, methane burning uh, burning gas up here. Uh, so this is a very typical mud volcano, the size and shape of a mud volcano in Tanimbar and also in Timor. Um, so what I'm going to do now is go through the stratigraphy of these. On these slides, um, there's a lot of text as well, and I'm not going to uh, go through the text. This is just for record. So if anybody's interested in, in following it up and reading through our descriptions from this, it'll save me the uh, trouble of actually publishing anything uh, but it's in, the, in proper journals, but the information's here. So um, starting with the oldest unit, the uh, Salu Formation. Now, if anybody's uh, worked in Timor and they've seen the Mobisi Formation, then they've pretty much seen the Salu Formation. It's exactly the same types of rocks. So there's limestones, fossiliferous limestones, there's uh, volcanic elastic sediments and there's volcanics. Um, Simon Barkham, our team, was working on a PhD at the same time in Timor, on the, partly on the uh, Mobisi formation, and he was entirely convinced that it was just a, a direct, direct equivalent. Um, we didn't get any firm um, age confirmations of this, but the, 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 uh, the brachypods in particular had a, had a, uh, a Permian aspect, so um, unquestionably, it's um, a Permian. There's a direct equivalent of the uh, Selu for uh, of the uh, Mobisi formation in Timor. So here's a couple of slides, just just a reminder on the map of where the Selu formation is exposed. Just found in this one river section so far. But this is a uh, crinoidal limestone. Uh, again, very similar to what you'd see in Timor in the Mobisi Formation. Volcanic clastic sediments, coarse volcanic clastic sediments. Um, in thin sections, I, I slightly uh, have to apologize for the 1980s technology of the uh, thin sections. We don't have a scale bar, for instance, but uh, and the, the, the pictures are uh, not that clear. But uh, so this is uh, one of the limestones with uh, fusilinids and bryozoa and things like that in it. Another one from the volcanic plastic with um, limestone, uh, sorry, with a, uh, basaltic uh, fragments and fossils in it and, uh, and a lot of sparry um, calcite in fill. So the next unit is the Maru Formation. Um, which again is very similar to the Babulu Formation or Babulu Group in Timor, and I presume also the Kaniki Formation in in, in uh, Saram, although I haven't visited Saram. Um, it's essentially Triassic in age. We think we've got good, particularly uh, late Triassic ages for this from um, 
from uh, palinomorphs um, and also perhaps move uh, passing up into the uh, uh, into the early Jurassic because some of the coals from collected from the mud volcanoes are um, giving early Jurassic ages. So continuing into the uh, perhaps into the early Jurassic. Um, some of the ages are also uh, early middle uh, Triassic. So, but essentially, I think it's probably mostly um, late Triassic. Uh, Turbidetics, uh, sandstone, shale successions mainly. So again, here's some of the rocks. Um, this is uh, from Marov Island. So the type, uh, well, at least the named uh, area um, for the formation, these dish structures at the tops of turbidite beds. Also, um, uh, much more probably maybe shallow marine uh, cross laminated sandstones in thin section, so it's a immature uh, quartz and uh, feldspar and, um, and rock fragments, micas in a, in a typically in a, in a clay matrix. Just occasionally, whilst in places, um, there are frog re reworked fragments, presumably derived from the, um, the Permian. Uh, Silu formation. So, suggesting that there's a um, obviously, well, we, we didn't find any stratigraphic relationships, but it's suggested that um, the two are uh, part of the same stratigraphic succession with reworking of the Permian into the Triassic. Of course, in Timor, some people in the past have suggested that the Mobisi formation, which is the equivalent, is allochthonous. Um, but uh, I think. Not, not so many these days, but uh, there's clear evidence, but it seems that um, this is part of the, the same succession in Tanimbar, at least. Contemporaneous, it seems, with the, uh, the marrow formation of the sandstone shales, there are uh, shallow marine limestones, what we've called the marrow formation. Um, again, we don't have any solid um, definite dates on these, but I say Simon Barkham, who work, was also working on the, well, the Triassic as well as the Permian limestones in Timor. And he was sure that these were uh, Norian type of uh, reefal limestones. Um, so I'm sorry about the sort of quality of some of these old uh, photos, but uh, this is a big outcrop of the Watar Formation limestone on Watar Island. Um, just this one, area but a very large outcrop of uh, limestones. Um, at outcrop you could see all sorts of fossils, uh, corals and sponges and uh, bracket pods and algae, things like that. So a typical Norian reef type limestone of this eastern Indonesia region. And also well, in, in the outcrop you, you got the impression of being able to see uh, lagoon, then reef, and then four reef, and this is uh, seems to be the sort of four reef breccia of the um, of that uh, uh, limestone or that reefal water formation. And here's a thin section of perhaps the the um, the uh, lagoon or fasces um, with the typical um, milliolids and things like that that I really outside my. Um, the next unit is the Libobar formation. That's this limestone um, on Libobar and Molo Islands. It's a, it's a type of marbly limestone. It's, it's fine grained, uniformly fine grained. We didn't find any fossils in it. And so we don't know what age it is. At the time, I think I thought it was um, maybe uh, also late Triassic. Uh, uh, a sort of a fascist equivalent of the uh, of of the uh, Watar formation, but it could be any age. It seems to be associated with the metamorphic rocks. It could be uh, older. It could be, for instance, equivalent of the um, Modio Dolomite of uh, New Guinea. Just got no idea. It's undated. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is this is uh, Libobar Island. And you can see all these limestone cliffs up here. And I'm afraid we didn't get up to this. We were mainly working around the coast 
and so we were examining the rocks down here. These look like, I mean, these could well be um, Triassic limestones, but I don't think they've been, haven't even been visited as far as I know, but maybe somebody's been there now. Um, but here we are looking at the limestones along the coast. You could just see these massive, uh, yeah, structuralist um, limestones to look at. Um, at outcrop, this is very typical, well, I don't know if it's typical, but very intense veining of uh, calcite. This is quite a dark one, but when, 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 you, when you hit it with the hammer, there's a definite smell of um, um, bitumen, bituminous material. Um, but yeah, we've got no idea on the age. In thin section, um, this part, the lower part is stained with um, uh, Alizar and Red S, but uh, you can see that there's uh, concentrations of uh, bituminous or oily material along the um, stylolites in this uh, fine grained limestone. But as I say, we don't know what age it is. And then we have this unit that I've, we haven't assigned a name to, not a formational name. It's just called, well, I would just refer to it as Jurassic Shales because. It's the material that forms the matrix of the mud volcanoes. We didn't anywhere find a proper outcrop of um, Jurassic shales, um, but it's abundantly present in the in the vol uh, mud volcanic erupted material, um, as dated by palynomorphs um, and uh, uh, yeah, well, mostly palynomorphs, but also this really nice collection um, of. Uh, Ammonites that we collected from one vol mud volcano. Unfortunately, we lost them. In a <laughs> there was a flood in the basement of University College, and we lost this material. Um, but uh, Professor Donovan uh, of University College, he before they were lost, he identified. So we have Hatangian, Cinnamorium, Plinsmac, and Tawasi. So the full range of the Lower Jurassic, based on these ammonites um, from one of the mud volcanoes on the uh, west coast of uh, Yamdena. Now again, similarities with Timor, this is uh, a direct equivalent of the Wailuli formation in Timor. So this is what the shales look like. This is uh, from one of the mud volcanoes, I think it's Mitak. Um, so the shales here, the grey shales, um, is again, if anybody has seen Either the Bobonaro complex or the uh, or the uh, or outcrops of Jurassic in uh, the Wailuli formation in Timor, they'll recognise the colour of the shales and blocks in it of um, sandstone, limestone, probably Triassic sandstones and limestones in this mud volcanic material. But as I say, we don't see any proper outcrops. We didn't find any proper outcrops of Jurassic shales, but it's clearly abundant. So this is that little island we mentioned um, in the Yamdana streets. Apparently it appeared above sea level just before our uh, 1987 field work and it disappeared again by the 1989 field work. And you can see it's just these gray shells with blocks in again and it's, it's a little mud volcano presumably. Um, and we did find in this the jawbone of an ichthyosaur but again Unfortunately, that's been lost. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this again is a matrix of Jurassic shales um, in the mud volcanoes. Now, uh, my favourite uh, stratigraphic unit from uh, Timor is the Ungar Formation. Um, on this section, uh, you can see where I've drawn it. If I was redrawing this section now, I'd probably push it down further so that the most of the sandstones, which is indicated here in the yellow, dotted unit would be down in more into the upper Jurassic and this uh, interval the Arumit member would be lower down Berries in Valentinian rather than up here. Um, but so this formation um, is two completely different uh, uh, lithological units. The, there's these massive sandstones um, of the main part of the Ungar formation but then just within the um, sandstone succession, there is this interval of uh, radiolarian shales and siltstones that we call the aromatic member. So some pictures, I'll, I'll just leave this on, this is the section, second page of notes, I'll leave it along, on long enough for 
anybody who wants to grab it from the screen in the future from the video. Um, so here's some pictures of the uh, Ungo Formation sandstone. Um, uh, you can see it, absolutely massive sandstones. Um, no shales in it. Um, uh, typically massive luminous type of colour. Just occasionally, still massive structure, but you can see what appears to be oil picking out uh, bedding um, on some in, in some horizons, but still within this massive limestone. And here's another uh, outcrop on a small island just off the coast of Vormali, one of these Western islands. What I really put this in was because it reminds me how when I visited this area in the 1980s, how beautifully clear the waters were around the islands. And unfortunately, when I revisited in 2011, there was so much plastic around on the coast. It was, it was, it was rather depressing. But uh, yeah, these lovely big, thick sandstones, um, well, typical of the Ungar formation. Mostly massive, but just occasionally, well, bedded like here. But again, still in this interval, no real interbeds of uh, of shale, very rare. I can't can't remember seeing any interbeds of shale um, in these sandstones. <coughs> uh, in thin section, it's uh, very uh, bimodal with these uh, big, well-rounded grains. I, I presume were originally aeolian sands, um, but then reworked into a, a marine environment with a subangular, mostly. Quartz grains, um, some some glauconite. Um, this uh, yeah, typical sandstone of the Ugar formation. Um, this is a a, 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 a higher magnification um, slide, just so, you, so you can see one of these uh, big aeolian or well-rounded quartz grains. But also, this is the only fossil we found in this unit. Presumably, some maybe some some type of foram um, within this, but. Um, Overall, uh, not at all fossiliferous. Um, this is a log that Simon Barkham uh, drew up for the section. Um, this is what we. This is our field work. So this is in the late eighties. Uh, this is compiled uh, in nineteen ninety six. Uh, Basil Jeffrey and Hale uh, did this paper where they a completely separate study, not related to our field work at all. Um, Rocks collected by Neville Hale a good good while earlier, um, but we were able to place them with this within this arrowbit member, um, which which is um, and they dated so this is uh, Tithonian Bariacian, so latest Jurassic or earliest Cretaceous, and then slightly more into the early Cretaceous. Um, so a good now a good constraint on the age of the arrowbit member here, uh, which I'll be talking about next, uh, and also. Uh, Zimmerman and Hall reported um, from a report from Impex Oil Company that they had actually there found late Jurassic palomorphs in these sandstones. Um, so this is the log of the section you can see <coughs> the sandstones, and then the aromatic member, then back into sandstones. So this is the section, the outcrop section. You can see sandstones exposed down here. This is on Ungar Island. So sandstones at the bottom of the section, sandstones at the top of the section, and then an 80 meter interval of um, siliceous siltstones and shales in between. They're perfect, very well exposed section. So this is what the arrowwit member looks like. Um, uh, friable shaley claystones and harder radi radiolaire and siltstones. Uh, and another picture of, of the unit, the, with the camera uh, sort of held parallel to bedding and um, so showing sort of hummocky cross stratification in this aromatic member. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> our first impression was that these were deep water se sediments. So they, um, they look vaguely like the um, Nakfuna or Waibua formation in Timor, um, which would be the same sort of age, early Cretaceous, but these are probably shallower. I think there's been some indication of maybe out in the retic environment. But as you can see, they're completely interbedded with the um, Ungar sandstone. So we've got the arrowbit member shales, just this one bed of 
uh, sandstone and before we go into the uh, top of the uh, back into the sandstones. So a clear interdigitation with the with the sandstones, which must I presume must be shallow marine sediments, um, and then these uh, what appear to be uh, deeper water sediments, but pro probably maybe aren't that deep. Um, but have we haven't uh, nobody's uh, been reported any detailed work on these yet on the uh, environments. So then above the uh, Mesozoic section, there's a big gap. Um, we think probably based on reworking that maybe there was originally there were sort of deep water limestones of late Cretaceous through to Paleogene age, based on material worked into the, the younger units, but these don't uh, outcrop, uh, or at least we didn't find outcrop of these type of rocks in Tanimbar. So the next unit above that is this uh, Tangustabun formation, <coughs> which um, was thought to be uh, maybe Paleogene, but that is probably based on these rework sediments. And in fact, um, the detailed study by Van Mahler, the uh, uh, micropaleontologist, um, these are early Miocene in age. And it's a succession of uh, sandstones interbedded with uh, uh, claystones. So this, remember, it's mostly exposed um, in the interior of uh, Yamdina, so the outcrop is uh, widespread. Uh, but here's a nice outcrop of a uh, massive sandstone, very poorly consolidated, as you can see. Um, it's just falling apart. Um, so this is the sandstone, and these are the uh, rather characteristic uh, pinkish orange shales, claystones. Um, you can see here the stratigraphic contact with the sandstones, uh, sort of bleaching of the, um, the colours again at the contact and dewatering structures in the sandstones. Um, cross lamination in the sandstone, ripple lamination. Um, and in thin section, uh, it looks like this, so mostly angular, small angular uh, quartz fragments, but also um, containing forearms and glauconite, there's a forearm down there, glauconite grains. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's the uh, Tangustaboom formation, followed by, you remember from the geological map, the Batibafudi formation, which is the most extensively exposed unit in eastern Yamdana. This is stated again by Van Mahler, uh, from our the, the samples we collected in 1986, um, <coughs> this is dated as middle to late uh, Miocene. And, um, consists of um, white uh, milestones, deep water, probably fairly deep water white milestones with interbeds of turbiditic, uh, uh, well, calcareous turbidites. So this is what the rock looks like. So this would be the, the marls, uh, whitish limestone, and then the limestones here, slightly grayer colored. Uh, these are rather distal uh, turbidites, calcareous turbidites. Um, so I say most of the uh, marls are white, but just um, this, this area, you, you see these colors, you remember the colors of the Tangustaboom formation. And although we didn't see the stratigraphic contact, it seems like there was the presumably transition from the Tangustaboom formation into the Batimafudi formation. Um, and that's also supported by the, the similar ages. So the early uh, Miocene Tangustaboom formation and the middle to late Miocene uh, Batimafudi formation. So most of the turbidites are distal. But this is one of the outcrops on Watar Island. And you can see a much more proximal uh, turbidite. Down in here, there are uh, large benthic forearms. Um, some of them are Eocene, and some of the old Dutch work dated um, rocks from this area as Eocene. We haven't found any, we didn't find any um, Eocene rocks, proper outcrop, but this is, that's probably why there are some old reports of Eocene um, rocks. So, reworked into these, the bases of these turbidites. <coughs> There's also the um, suggestion on the um, GRDC map um, 
that uh, there's a transition from east to west from proximal um, uh, limestone dominant to marl dominant. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, as I say, these, these um, proximal turbidites are on the Western islands. Uh, I, if anything, I suspect it's a, a stratigraphic change with um, a vertical with the marls more to work towards the base, passing more up into the limestones of the uh, uh, main part of the Bati Mafudi formation. In thin section, this is what the uh, typical um, uh, Bati Mafudi limestones look like, packed with a, well, planktonic, but also benthic uh, foramifera. And the final unit uh, is the Batty Lambuti formation, uh, Plyo Pleistocene age, and that's unconformably above the um, um, older succession. We don't. I, I I didn't see the unconformity, although perhaps I did in the 2011 field work. But uh, whereas the um, um, the Batty Mafudi formation is strongly deformed in fold and thrust belt structures. The typical Batty Lambuti formation is just pretty much undeformed. This is Tanjung Batty Lambuti, and so just um, calcareous sandstones passing up into typical quaternary reef at the top of the section. And uh, you can see this is um, Tanjung Batty Lambuti. There's probably a young fold along this, uh, in through this bay, the axis of the fold down through here. And this is the southern limb of the fold. And you can see these reefal terraces, they're not parallel, probably um, developing during the folding of the uh, of this anticline, this young anticline. That's on the uh, east coast. On the west coast, there's uh, at this village of Batiputi, there are not surprisingly white rocks, uh, but here they're all, almost uh, horizontal, hardly, hardly to form the um, Marley limestones on this coast. So that's a quick run through the stratigraphy and I'll briefly look at the structure. So as we've already mentioned, we have the uh, Tanamar trough immediately to the east. And th this um, blue unit is the thin skin fold and thrust belt. It's just a typical stack stacking up of um, units with folds and thrusts. Um, then beyond that, we have this uh, mud volcano area. Um, of Melange belt, and then this belt of older, mostly deeper, deeper seated rocks. Now, originally, when I when I reported on this area, we were I think we were imagining there was a thrust along here in placing these on top. Didn't really see any evidence to support that. I, I think I also suggested there was a a wrench fault down here. No real evidence for that either. It might be the case, but. I think more likely this is actually now, I think it's more likely to be more of an extension zone. Certainly on the seismic lines, the dominant structures you see are extension for most of the area. There may be a back thrust uh, along the um, uh, western margin of the high border in the Weber Basin. You just get the idea that you might be seeing a thrust here on the seismic lines, but it's, it's questionable. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, so this is, um, as I say, you don't see a lot of the structure of the fold and thrust belt, uh, but it, the uh, digital terrain models do quite nicely pick out this uh, structure, thanks to this one from Steve Kay, um, my geophysical colleague at the time, um, picking out these, these nice, nice ridges of our um, imbricated fold and thrust belt in this uh, eastern part of Yamdana. So as I say, the outcrop of these in the jungles isn't very good, but this is on the, on the shore of eastern Yamdana, and it shows the style and size of folding in this fold and thrust belt. So the typical anticlines, maybe two, 300 meters uh, across strike, quite continuous uh, along strike structures. Maybe, um, well, I have no idea how long, but they seem to be fairly continuous structures. Um, so it's a typical sort of folding style in this belt. Um, this is a section from, uh, as you see right in the, 
the middle of uh, Yamdina. Um, and it's based on this um, river section we logged in the 1986 field work, um, recording the, uh, the well, sampling the uh, Miocene sediments from the Tangustaboom formation into the Batimafudi formation. And this is a highly speculative, and I, maybe I wouldn't draw it like this now, but this is what I drew up to try and explain the recorded dips and folds that we saw along this, this river section, and suggesting that, the, that there's very typically these two sizes of uh, structures in this east belt. So you've got these tight little folds and things, as I say, it's com comparable to those ones I was showing in, uh, on that shoreline outcrop. So folding on a scale of a few hundred meters, but then repetitions on a much bigger scale, sort of two, three kilometers, four kilometers, um, structural repetition. And you can see how they have this nice, simple dipping bedding pattern down here, and then suddenly becoming more complex here. Um, and, they, and they fold uh, within the core of what seems to be the uh, Tangustabun uh, outcrop area. So it's just to show the type of style of uh, deformation that I'm sort of interpreting in this fold and thrust belt, as I say, not very well exposed. So the only other, uh, another uh, size, uh, uh, control on structure is, of course, seismic, and I've never been able to get good access to uh, some seismic data from here. But this is a sketch of a seismic line from Adrian Richardson's thesis. Um, uh, this section passes through what was the uh, Egoron Strait, Salat Egoron, between uh, the south of Yamdena and Salaro Island, so near Salmlaki. Um, and it shows uh, the, the structures so from the um, Tanimbar Trough through most of the um, Tanimbar Islands. And of course, it has this um, structure of uh, thrusting uh, verging towards the Tanimbar Trough. Um, when I, now I look at it uh, a lot later, it seems that there's really not too much, um, uh, it, it's not a huge amount of shortening in these structures. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe just a few kilometers to maybe a few tens of kilometers of shortening in here. This is, you know, this is a, not a huge subduction zone. It's, uh, um, it's cumulative, of course, backwards, so there's more happening. There's more shortening being taken up as you move into the uh, complex, but these frontal folds, folds and thrusts are fairly um, small scale. Um, I mean, at this time, I, when I drew this, I was interpreting maybe there's inversion, uh, bringing up basements or shallowing basement into the complex. Um, but as you can see, there's still a lot of uncertainty on this structure, and I'm sure better new size because it's now available um, to improve the picture. Uh, but also there's gravity, Steve K. gravity. Um, Steve was essentially a geophysicist and he, he did mostly gravity surveying in Tanimbar. So this is his Bougie gravity map. And you can see overall Tanimbar is essentially, seems to have this uh, well, gravinal structure with a, a big gravity low in here and gravity highs on either flank. So this is the Western Islands. Here's the uh, east coast of Yamdena. And so this well-constrained uh, gravity, gravity low down here, which not surprisingly trends straight into the colder graben um, to the south of the Tanimbar Islands. <coughs> now, Jeff, I, I think Jeff, Jeff Malay Hollow, when he uh, uh, asked me to do this talk, he wanted to talk particularly about the petroleum prospectivity of the uh, area. Um, I don't know a great deal about Abadi, but the important thing, of course, and um, these other fields to the south is there's commercial hydrocarbons in the colder carbon, and it's trending straight towards Tanimbar. So that's very encouraging. Um, for the structural story, I just want to talk about this old um, seismic line um, through here. Um, so this is this is uh, um, a sketch of a seismic line from uh, well, from the 1991, so quite old but still valid, I'm sure. Um, so this is obviously in time, two-way time. Um, in this lower one, I've converted it to depth based on the 
uh, line dock section, line dock stratigraphic section. Um, and this dotted line is approximately the bottom of the seismic. Um, and then I've extrapolated the faults down into this interpretation of a maybe a low angle detachment, about 10 kilometers. And what I'm doing uh, um, is using this as a potential analog for tannin bar, which you remember is located a long strike to the north. So using this as a, a pre-collisional pre analog of tannin bar. So if you take this into the collision zone, what would happen? Well, probably this nice big horizontal uh, extension zone would be reused as a thrust, a reverse fault. Um, so what would happen if you pushed on this uh, uh, basal thrust? I'm sure Ron could do, Ron Harris could do much better modeling of this, but uh, this is just um, my schematic uh, modeling, pushing on this thrust. Now, because of the curvature of these thrusts, you're pushing from horizontal and turning it up much steeper. And that's, of course, going to be putting the brakes on. So I think you would get probably quite small inversion structures associated with these big curved faults. But maybe these more uh, linear faults, these planar faults, would uh, deform like this. So thrusting, back thrusting in this direction. And I hope you see what I'm trying to suggest for perhaps the deeper structure of tannin bar, um, so which is what I'm in here. So getting the back thrusting here, which is uplifting the Western Island regions here, uh, deeper structuring below the, below the shallow fold and thrust belt. And this is a later stage of the thrusting, basement involved. Maybe you could be good turning some of these um, basement uh, ex extension zones into inverting um, normal faults turned into uh, inversion through reverse faults and producing potentially these deeper structures. So this is the um, this is this uh, structure we were seeing on shore for, for scale and suggesting the type of folds that you can suggest as a possibility uh, under the deep area of um, uh, tannin bar, central tannin bar area. And just for comparison, this is um, Osse oil field in um, Saram which would be the same geology like Triassic, early Jurassic. And so just suggesting, obviously, um, the potential this area could have for um, prospectivity. Um, Panama is a lovely, lovely flat area to be fairly well suited to seismic, but I uh, admit it would be a brave company that actually um, did this work. But it, I think it's uh, got definite petroleum potential. Okay, that's all I've got to say now for the Tannenbar Islands. Now, Kai Islands, uh, rather more briefly, um, but as I said previously, so a long trend from Tannenbar, uh, and the same situation with the Webber Deep immediately to the west and then the volcanic arc, and Aru Island to the uh, east, and the Tannenbar Trough down here, but becoming the Aru Trough up here. A rather different uh, geological feature. Um, so, sort of a location structural map of um, the K Islands. Um, so, the, the Western Islands, uh, Kur, Fadol, are uh, rather similar to the, um, the Western Islands of Tanimbar with metamorphic rocks, Triassic sandstones, probably Jurassic shale with iron stones. Um, so, very similar sort of deeper uh, uh, rocks, similar to the Western Islands of Tanimbar. Then, as in Tanimbar, you move into a belt or dominated by mud volcanoes, um, like the Salat Yamdena uh, region in Tanimbar, so that extends through the Tayandu Islands and into the Western Kaikajio Islands. Um, and then in, in the Eastern Kaikajio Islands, you seem to have possibly a few uh, ridges of more coherent folded rocks, although this isn't exposed, it's this is all mainly Quaternary Reef over here. And the deformation front of the uh, band of collision zone seems to be along Salat Narong um, between Kai Kichil and Kai Basar. Um, and then Kai Basar Island itself is completely different. It's part of the Australian margin. Um, it's dominated by uh, normal faults, not by thrusting. Um, the difference between the two islands, so this is Kai 
Kachil, uh, sorry, Kai Kachil and Kai Basar. And you can see the difference in the topography of these huge normal faults running parallel to the axis of uh, Kai Basar. And, the, and this Kai Kachil island, mostly all just uh, reef, reef limestones. So this is the uh, an aerial shot just showing how flat and geologically uninteresting it is. As the, the, there are many mud volcanoes, there's a big one down here. Um, but I've not worked in these islands um, because they weren't that interesting geologically. Uh, this is looking from above Kaibasar, Kaikachil, looking to Kaibasar in the distance. Whereas these are mostly tens, maybe 100 meters elevation. Kaibasar is up to about 800 meters elevation. Uh, quite a striking difference between the islands. So obviously, I did most of my work, geologic field work in uh, Cape Bazaar. Um, there are mainly three exposed, three main stratigraphic units, the Alap Formation, Tamangel Member or Formation, and the Wedowar Formation. So the Alap Formation is essentially Eocene. Oh dear, I've lost my... Can anybody hear me? I've completely lost my... Yeah, yeah, you're all right. We can yes, go ahead. Again. We can still I, do it. I've, I've got, I've got, I've got completely blind. My, my screen is. I'm trying to. Don't have my screen. Oh Ooh. God! What can I do? <laughs> perhaps you, you could press escape or something that can. I have pressed escape. Of... Yeah. Um... Oh dear! You can up? see your screen. We can see your. You screen. can see it fine. Yeah. yeah okay. I, moving. I've got. I've got a black screen. Um, let's try pressing some random buttons. Um, I can't. I can't continue though. I'm afraid. Um, let me. Um, can you give me two minutes? I can go up. Check. Go onto my other computer. Yep. Uh, I would just like to remind you as well that the um, the time for for fifteen minutes almost almost at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I'm virtually there. I nearly finished. Uh, if you want to cut the time. Um, oh God, what do I do? I, I'm going to stop the, I'm going to restart the computer. Yep. Give me, sorry. Why don't you start a discussion of Ron's work and I'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll give you some time to sort out the computers on that other end. So that that was the talk from, uh, Tim. Uh, unfortunately, there was, um, uh, technical issues on, on his end and hopefully it can go back um, and uh, we'll continue into the discussions uh, with uh, Ron, Professor Ron Harris at the moment. So should there be any questions from the audience, um, you can raise your hands or perhaps writing, write down your questions on your chat box. If there is any questions from the audience first, otherwise I'll try to uh, kick off the Q&A uh, questions by um, asking Professor Harris the questions that we've been asked quite a few times. Oh, Pak Jeff, mau tanya? No, no, you, you, you go ahead first. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, well, first of all, I like I like the Ganesh countertop on your kitchen, at your kitchen. Uh, run just um and more so the earthquake simulations it was quite inspiring using simple tools to explain very difficult things um as well as your work that been carried out with the young generations of indonesia um my question was is actually um if you have to choose which one of the following should we prioritize to develop a resilient communities Educations or investment in high tech. Which which one should come first? And could you, could you elaborate on that? Um, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay. Um, I I don't I don't think that high tech solutions are the answer. For example, when we had um, uh, in two thousand four, we had you know high tech solutions. That, that were there before and mostly thereafter, they never worked. We have a tsunami early warning system 
in Indonesia that uh, Indonesia invested millions of dollars in, which is a high-tech solution. And it hasn't worked once <laughs> to actually get people to evacuate in time before the tsunami arrives. In fact, it actually created more problems than it solved because people knew it was there. They waited. Precious time. Um, and there's examples from especially earthquakes in Sumatra where sometimes the earthquake warning was called off because they didn't understand the earthquake well enough. I mean, you're dealing with such short periods of time for tsunamis. And earthquakes, you don't have any warning at all. The exception to the tech would be the earthquake um, alarms. They're a very simple low-tech solution to using the difference in the P wave versus the S wave arrival times to have a warning. I mean, the best example of this, there was an earthquake recently in Mexico City. Actually, the earthquake was on the trench, which is about 300 kilometers away from Mexico City. The P wave arrives. It, it activates the warning system. And, and the people had 20 to 30 seconds to get out of the buildings before the shaking started. So that would be the only exception. The examples of low tech are the least educated and least res and and those people with the least resources, the sea gypsies that lived on some of the islands in the Andamans, they had the highest survival rates from the 2004 tsunami. Why? Because they created a myth about Laboon, which was this wave that eats people. And the way you know that the wave is coming is the ground starts to shake. So they had the science completely wrong. The tech was completely not there. No education, except for that one thing where they made a connection between the natural signs of the tsunami and what to do about it. When they felt the ground shaking, no matter how long it lasted, they thought Laboon was coming. And so they would evacuate up into the mountains and stay there for three or four hours. And they'd come back and their village would be completely destroyed, but nobody was dead, right? And that's because they use natural signs. And that's where education can really make a big difference. And like I said, if the people in 2004 tsunami in Banda Aceh would have known 20, 20, 20, then there would have been tens of thousands of lives saved without any investment in technology at all. Did that answer your question? Yes, um, I think that was the answers I was looking for. I mean, with as a as a, as a lecturer and as a student, um, that um, contact with the communities always being asked about how, what should we do and paying attention to local uh, wisdoms and can, can we elaborate on the local wisdom to see that um, that can help the community to, to be a more resilient at, with the additions of technology, perhaps that will be even better, but getting to know the danger, um, get used to it and then knows what, when it will come. As you said, in some, in some local communities, they have the myth that, that train them, that to ingrain the event in their brains that to, to make them prepared of these uh, things that could happen in the future. So I think one, one particular um, efforts that we need to do other than to add more into the, the complexity of the technology. Thank yeah. you very much for, for the answer, Professor Harris. But Jeff, would you like to add something or ask uh, something? Yeah, yeah, just... Uh, just two, two quick questions, uh, Ron. One, I'm very interested in this earthquake alarm. Uh, has it been used extensively elsewhere? And who is there a pattern on it? That's the first question. And the second question is, you've got areas where there's a lot of uh, earthquake and tsunamis, such as Japan and, and USA, etc. Are they things we can learn from those areas that 
can be applied to in Benetia in general and Maluku specifically? Great, great questions. So the first one about the earthquake alarm. So there are several different places that sell them. Um, I don't know about the patent situation, um, but I can find out. And they have been used extensively. I just gave an example of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. and, and also in Japan, um, earthquake, earth, the, the feeling of the, of the P wave and in California, the feeling of the, P, the sensor of the, on the P wave shuts down their trains shuts down um, natural gas and uh, water facilities so that when the shaking arrives, that they're not vulnerable. And, and so it's the best way, especially for the kind of buildings that we have in Indonesia. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, when people reach the middle class, they, they want to have something other than a bamboo house. And so, they, and so they build it out of unreinforced masonry. They use the worst possible mix of concrete. They have little to no rebar. They have a heavy roof. And that's just, these are just death traps waiting for an earthquake to flatten them. And, and, and so, you know, getting out of that building is key. And so if you can have something that can give you even a few seconds of warning, but most of the time, five or six or 10 seconds. The, another good thing about them that I like, because we use them here in Utah, is that in schools, we have them in a lot of classrooms and the teacher can go over and flick the earthquake alarm with their finger and it'll sound it. And the students get used to hearing that particular alarm. It's not a fire alarm, it's an earthquake alarm and they know exactly what to do when that happens. And so it's a lot easier to reinforce by having drills. It's the answer for reducing the amount of death and destruction. The destruction, maybe not, but at least the death that's happening in these events in Indonesia. The second question was, let me remind me. Uh we can learn from anywhere in, in US and Japan, for instance. But oh, yeah. Well, that's what we've already we answered some of that. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean, in places that are earthquake prone, we now have shutoffs. And again, those sh shutoffs are activated by the arrival of the P wave, which we don't feel, right? We don't feel that. It comes through. And it's not till the S waves arrive, which are much slower, that you start to have the shaking and then when the long wavelength waves arrive, that's when most of the damage occurs. And so anything that can give us some time to react, if we don't have time to, if we don't, if we can't leave the house or if we're in a building that's not as vulnerable, then we can duck cover and hold on. And, and if, if we are in a poorly built structure, which most of them are in Indonesia, we can evacuate. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to evacuate from an earthquake has never been available till now. We should take advantage of it. So that's the only tech part that I would recommend. The rest, simple education on natural science and how to build back better. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Harris. But Jeff, thank you. There are two more questions for Professor Harris, but I'd like to uh, take our attention to another questions here. Um, for Dr. Tim, because some of our students here at University of Patimura are now being prepped for the development of a Masela field in the future. Um, on the face of the challenge that are looming on the horizons, um, would you be kind to share your opinion about what are things need to be pay attention for and needs to um, be uh, elaborate on the, the discussion about the Masela and Abadi field for our students here. Tim. Well, uh, um, as I say, I don't know a great deal about uh, Masela. Um, uh, the, the best I guess I can talk about is the analogy with Sunrise, which is um, a very similar development, um, which is still under discussion in, in 
very very big discussion in Timor Leste um, whether to take the uh, oil, uh, take the gas to um, Darwin and Australia, which is a lot further, or to take it across the Timor Trough into um, um, in, in, into uh, the south coast of Timor Leste. Um, and I think the same discussion. Well, I, I, I'm sure you're not considering sending uh, a body gas to Australia, but um, you, you are certainly a um, plan. I, I think the plan is to develop it in Solaru, is that right? Um, yeah. It's certainly a, a, an easier task, probably, into uh, Marcella, uh, into uh, Solaru with the uh, Tannenbaum trough is a lot shallower. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on it in, um, in, uh, Timor Leste now there's a big there's a big push now to get um, Sunrise developed and developed by um, facilities onshore in Timor Leste. I mean it's politically it's um it's it's the only option. Um, there's no no way I think that uh, Timor Leste will accept the oil going to uh, the gas going to Darwin. Um, and I, I would presume there'll be a similar story in um, Tan. Uh, for the uh, Abadi, um, it's um, I see now that um, there's a push for um, Abadi to be or, or new investment, more Indonesian investment into Abadi, um, and it's an interesting parallel story. So I mean, the <coughs> technical di difficulties um, for uh, um, Abadi and for Sunrise are very similar, and uh, I guess uh, outside my area of uh, competence with a. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, important to uh, get feedback from one project to the other. I guess would be the main main thing. All right. Thank you very much. Because uh, this another questions for Professor Harris is related to that particular object uh, subject too about where to put whether to put the rigs onshore or offshore for the Abadi and Masela um, prospects here, uh, which I think um, will be a very long discussions for the time being. Um, if should, should there is any um, more insights from both of you regarding this, especially Tim already answered, perhaps Professor Harris would add to that. That will be um, brilliant. But if not, uh, we can continue to the next questions. If there any, is there any um, additions from Professor Harris regarding this matter? Yeah, well, it, it depends on how deep the water is, right? So how, how deep is the water there where the rig's going to be? Um, the Tanimba Trough, uh, that will be around two kilometers. Is that right, Tim? Yeah, it's a sh shallow, but I think Ron's talking about the actual site of the Abadi drilling. Um, it's, it's, the, it's more the development of whether to develop. Uh, well, there are in, in Timor, there are well for, for Sunrise, which is very similar. Um, there are three options whether to process the gas in Darwin, which is of course just straight across the um, uh, Australian shelf, or to take the gas in a pipeline to the bottom of the Timor Trough and up to Timor, or whether originally Shell would have been involved and they, they were developing floating LNG, but the, that seems to have gone out of favor. And Shell have also, have they pulled out now of a body or are they pulling out of a body? Or are they selling their um, interest in a body? Um, but anyway, I think the um, nobody's too keen on developing it by floating LNG now. Am I right? Um, yeah. Um, well, so it's, <laughs> yeah. I, so it's a, the reason why the water depth makes a difference is because the tsunami is indetectable in water that's more than a few hundred meters deep. Hmm. It's so it's not going to affect a floating rig or. Or even a rig that's you know in in water that's deeper than 500 or a few hundred meters. But what happens when the tsunami starts to arrive onto the shoreline? The front of the tsunami slows down because the water is more shallow. The back of the tsunami keeps going, and the tsunami rises from only a meter height in open water to you know mm -hmm. tens of meters. And so I think in most cases, I don't think a tsunami is going to be a threat to an oil rig. Yeah, it's, probably, it's not the rig, it's more the facilities on, on shore, I guess. On the, shore. Uh, yeah, if you, if you the, decide um, to put pipes across the trough, there will be a lot of earthquake that trigger landslide, things like that, I think would be 
right a that's, that's a whole different matter that's yeah. that's an earthquake thing right and like like tim says if if you have a facility that's right on the coast like the fukushima nuclear mm -hmm. power plant <laughs> then you're going to have to mitigate for it you're going to have to make sure that it's for, far enough away from the coast that a tsunami is not going to reach it and yeah. Solaro probably isn't, uh, it's fairly flat, so it's uh, probably not going to be anywhere to be far enough. It, well, nothing close enough to shore to be um, safe mm. from tsunamis, I would imagine. Right. Thank you very much for both of your answers. Um, perhaps this is the last questions um, from the audience. If there isn't any other questions, this is from Joe Ronnie to Professor Ron Harris. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about the uh, other areas apart from um, the Ambon that you studied elaborately, uh, some areas like Banda Neira and uh, some small islands to the southeast of Seram and Ambon that could potentially um, affected greatly by the earthquake. Are there any areas around Maluku that we need to pay attention to a bit more because it's potential to have large earthquake and tsunami based on your research, Professor Harris. Well, I showed that that map of um, of the potential areas. Uh, I think right here. Yeah. Whoops. So this, this shows, um, you know, what the potential is right here. That circle is Maluku, the circle, and you're surrounded by subduction zones that are heavily loaded with elastic strain energy. Hmm. And so we're expecting a magnitude nine here any moment. Like if it, this shows you how big the earthquake would be if it happens right now, right? It would be a 9.0 here, which probably wouldn't affect Maluku as much, but we have this trough, the Tanambar Timor trough. We know very little about its earthquake history because it wasn't really colonized, right? But we have tsunami deposits all along these islands that we found. The oldest or the youngest one's 500 years old. The oldest one is, uh, is 1500 years old and there's one that's 1000 years old, which suggests there's a 500 year recurrence interval of huge mega thrust earthquakes along this, along this trough. Right, and that would infect all of these islands. And then we have this one, which has already created two mega thrust events, one in 1629 and one in 1852. And again, already it has enough to create an 8.8. .8. Uh, I, what I guess I, the answer to that question is, I don't know any place you would you could possibly go in this yellow circle here where you would be safe. Right. So there are plenty of research to be held on across the East Indonesia then to <laughs> replicate right, the success stories of um, defining some of the results that you got from some of the islands in East Indonesia and try to apply that to uh, do the uh, research on those uh, separate islands historically to see if there is any particular team that crops out so that you can learn from the history and then gave that to the communities to, to learn better. So you guys asked the question about, can we learn anything from Japan and North America? Yeah. And the bottom line is this. In 2011, Japan had an earthquake, same size as the Sumatra earthquake. It affected the same amount of people with the same amount of density of population. In Japan, 20,000 people died and very few buildings collapsed. In mm. Indonesia, 200,000 people died in the Indonesian region and many buildings collapsed. And the difference was not the size of the earthquake or the size of the tsunami. The <laughs> difference was the level of preparedness of the people. That's mm. a matter of education, communication and implementation.
And, and that's the message that we need to take home. California, the same way. They have a magnitude 7.5 Earth, earthquake, loss of damage, less than 100 people die hmm. because their buildings are built to seismic code. Right. Got that. And I think um, due to our limited time, as a closure to our uh, talks uh, this afternoon, um, I would like both our of our speakers to comment on, um, I think this one related to the questions that have been asked by Pak Pras from UPN Jogja, where um, do you see the importance of um, the collaborations between or within the communities? Pak Pras is asking about the, the role of movement in the mitigation movement. And I'd like to broaden the questions for the hazard mitigations and geoscience. Um, do you see the importance of collaborations within the communities, the scientists, the um, the local people, the governments, and medias, perhaps, in terms of getting all those uh, things together, um, and for the hazard mitigations and geoscience in general? That's for Professor Harris and uh, Dr. Charlton, if you'd like to uh, put your opinion on that. Go ahead, Tim. No, you go ahead. Well, um, there's, I, I don't know about um, community involvement for um, uh, field, geological field work, but there's so much geological field work that trained Indonesian geologists could and should be doing in, in these areas. I mean, as I say, I've worked in um, Tanimbar and K 30 years ago, and I haven't seen much published since. I mean, the, I mean, Tanimbar is a you know it's a, a most interesting island, and uh, I was uh, I mean, uh, yeah, there's there's just encouragement to do more field work. I don't know um, how how the field programs are doing in uh, Tanimbar, but uh, I guess it's money. Um, yeah. I can't really say much more from a uh, straight geology point of view, but Ron, over to you. I, I think what you said, Tim, is, is very, very important. Um, I just got back from Timor-Leste where they have, have dedicated millions of dollars to a mapping program of their entire country. Although the country's small, they have one to 50,000 sheets and they've got mapping teams on each one. We connected with geologists from a university in Kukpong in West Timor and tried to get a collaboration going, but they don't have any funds for doing basic foundational field mapping, like what Tim says. I don't think you can really do much unless you have that foundation for hazards or for oil and gas, or minerals, or whatever. You have to have that, and Indonesia needs to needs to follow the lead of other countries and and invest money into basic field mapping. The maps that the GRDC produced are great for a first one to two hundred fifty thousand scale uh, broad brush, but they don't really help much with, with the other details. And what I would say. Hello. <laughs> So about Pa Pross's uh, question, I, I showed the example of what they did in Ambon, where they brought together these agencies that overlap onto disaster mitigation, the Red Cross, the, the Homeland Security, you know, the BMKG, and so on. And, and for the first time, they started talking to one another and realized but there were things that they could do collaboratively to, to um, reduce the amount of, of repetition on what they were doing. And it was all community-based. And I think a team like that should be built in every single major city in Maluku. All right, I think that was... Uh, two strong messages for our students here and our geoscience communities in Indonesia. 
though the basic works um, still plenty to do um, in Indonesia, especially where we have um, a lot of tension going on for hazard mitigations and explorations, any kind of natural resources. And I think um, those basic stuff, we still need to do those things in collaborations with many partners, perhaps uh, domestically and also internationally to have the results in kind of a better uh, community development for resilience and the explorations for the natural resources. Um, I think our time is up. Um, on behalf of Iagi Maluku and Iagi, um, uh, this the uh, Pusat for the center of the Iagi, uh, we would like to thank our two speakers, Professor Ron Harris and Dr. Chim Tarleton, for their talks and their discussions. Um, I know, um, Professor Harris now is about well, late in the midnight now. What time is it now? It's uh, 3 a.m. 3 a.m. in the morning. So we shall appreciate uh, our two speakers with kind of round of applause, please, everybody. So this was this was the core of a community-based um, improvement where we can learn from anyone, anybody in the world, um, which the uh, who has the means and who has the uh, good faith on sharing their knowledge to ours so that we can learn from them and with them together. Uh, for the betterment of um, our communities. So I'd like to thank Professor Harris and Dr. Tim Tarleton for the talks. And I'll uh, return the baton to the MCs. Mbak atau Kak, Catherine. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank all of you, especially for Professor Ron Harris, Dr. Tim Carlton, Mr. Burhanuddin Nur, Mr. Hervin Samalehu, and Mr. Alvin Rudiawan. Before we end this event, I will guide us to take a picture again. So for the participant, please turn on your camera. <laughs> Okay, give you all the best pause. One, two, three, say cheers. Okay. Next slide. One, two, three, say cheers. Is that the symbols for in harm's way? <laughs> no, this is a symbol <laughs> for 202020. Oh, 2020. So you can see it says Dua Palu Tika Kali. 2020. Oh, oh, you okay. I got it. Now. Okay, okay. That. okay. There's the 20, and it's three times. Okay, okay. That's brilliant. Yeah. Right. Dua Palu Tika Kali. Okay. Dua Palu Tika Kali. Okay. Trio Dua Palu. Dua Palu Tika Kali. Terima kasih banyak. Yeah. See you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Prof. Harris. Dr. Thank Tim. you. Thank you very much, Professor Harris and okay. Tim for staying up with us early Thank in the morning. You. In the okay. yeah. I'm Thank sorry, you. Mr. Okay. Okay. Alvin. 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 Your, your talks will be on the Thank next one, Dr. Tim. Yeah. There will be another yeah. talks for Tanimbar and K, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Alvin. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Tim. At least I finished time. Ron, at thank least. you. Okay, thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe yeah. and healthy. Thank you, Pak Bu. Terima kasih, Pak. Thank you, Pak Irvin. Sekali lagi nih. Kak Irvin, terima kasih. Pak Irvin, gimana Pak Irvin? Iya, Pak. Makasih, Pak. Pak Oman, izin. Terima kasih, Pak Oman. Iya. Iya, Pak. Siap. Saya duluan Pak Hervin, Pak Hervin ya. Iya, makasih. Saya duluan Pak Jeff. Ya, makasih Pak Alvin. Alvin, makasih Pak Alvin. Pak, Pak Zain, wah udah lama ketemu Pak Zain nih. Iya. Nah ini Pak Zain ini. Sorry, sorry di belakang layar. Iya, Pak udah. layar. Saya datangin malah kabur Pak Zain. Ini penghilang eh, terus ini Pak Alvin. Kayak layar malah. Kemarin yang survei laut jadi gak sempat. Gak sempat oh, ketemu, iya. mohon maaf. Iya. Next time. Ya udah, saya lihat semuanya ya. 
Iya, Pak. Terima kasih banyak Nur Pisa. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Pak Ven. Ket, makasih, Ket. Iya, Pak Ertin. Terima kasih. Selamat sore semuanya. Selamat sore semuanya. Selamat sore. Alicia, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Alicia Rosita, terima kasih. Ya. Bapak Ervin, silakan. Lift juga ya. Ya, ya, silakan, silakan, silakan. Kasih mati, ya, minta kasih mati. Oke, silakan, Pak. <laughs>